Hello and greetings. This is Train Time, the podcast. And it really is train time, even here in the United States. I'm Karen Christensen, and I started the Train Campaign, a project of the Barrington Institute, in 2011. I began recording interviews with politicians and train activists in 2017, most in the U.S., but sometimes looking to projects in other parts of the world. I hope you'll subscribe to Train Time and also send me your questions and suggestions. And visit our YouTube channel, Train Campaign, for some great interviews and amazing historical footage. I'm Karen Christensen. Some people call me the train lady. I think back to one Saturday morning when I was looking through a pile of old garden tools at a tag sale in the Berkshires. The woman running the sale walked over to me. I know you, she said. You're the woman who wants to bring back the trains. I nodded. Well, good luck with that, she said. Her skepticism didn't surprise me. I'd heard it all before. Don't count your chickens. Don't hold your breath. A lot of people still think that passenger rail service from the Berkshires in western Massachusetts to Grand Central Terminal in Manhattan is pie in the sky or a pleasant daydream. They are startled and then excited when I explain that it's perfectly feasible to restore train service and that Massachusetts has already invested more than $50 million to that end. I point in the direction of the tracks and I say, we could have passenger trains here this year. The tracks are ready. I may be called the train lady, but I'm not a lifelong train buff. In fact, I didn't ride a train until I was 19 and moved to England. But for over a decade, I devoted a lot of volunteer time to the train campaign, a grassroots group that was, and still is, a project of the Barrington Institute. This podcast is being recorded in July 2024, not a time when trains or public transportation are the top thing on people's minds. But I'm often asked about the current situation with the Berkshire Line, as well as about the Amtrak service called the Berkshire Flyer. I've written before about these projects and how they are different, so I'm making this recording in the hope that it will soon be superseded by further developments on the Berkshire line. There's also a good deal of discussion in Massachusetts about an improved east-west train service across the state to Boston. That's another story, though, a big and important one, and I will leave that to my more knowledgeable colleague, Ben Heckscher, of Trains in the Valley. Again, I'll put the details in the show notes. I started the train campaign in 2011 when I'd returned from China, where I'd been riding some of their truly remarkable, excellent, fast, high-speed trains. I had the simple idea that a beautiful rural region like ours could attract new 21st century commerce by being seamlessly connected to an important global hub. Our goal has always been the restoration of passenger service on the Berkshire line. That is the traditional rail service here that for many years since 1838 was important and and essential to this area. There have been ups and downs, and we are indeed waiting in a siding, like a a train waiting for the dispatcher to to give it the go-ahead. But I'd like to share the history of this project and explain something about the work that's been done already to the tune of over $50 million on the Massachusetts portion. Much of this has been recorded over the years in articles and interviews and some short films that you can find on our YouTube channel. The links will be in the show notes. Until 1971, 50 years before I got involved in this, the Berkshire Line carried passengers from Grand Central Terminal to Danbury, Connecticut, up through western Connecticut along the Housatonic River. The tracks remain in place today, and they continue even after passenger service was was uh, stopped, along with the same the same situation across the country. But it continued to serve as a freight rail line and and to be used by the privately held Housatonic Railroad Company. In 2010, just before I became involved, the company commissioned a study 
They wanted to know how much demand there would be for passenger service on the line that they were using for freight. This study determined that restoring passenger service to Berkshire County would provide an estimated 2 million single fare passengers with a fast, convenient, and comfortable connection to Connecticut and New York City. This led to an important development. In 2014, legislators on Beacon Hill in Boston passed a transportation bond bill that included money for the project, um, the Massachusetts part of the project. They first by purchasing by the state, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the 37 miles of track that are in Massachusetts from the Housatonic Railroad Company for $13 million. The legislator, legislature also allocated $35 million to replace 30 miles of rail and replace old ties on all 37 miles. The agreement further stated that Massachusetts would spend an additional $79 million for more extensive work when Connecticut authorized funding for their portion of the project. As I've said, the the line goes down through the western part of Massachusetts and then down in along the, going south in western Connecticut, and then then going cutting into New York. The purchase documents were clear about the commitment being made. This is a quotation from the the document, the contract. The acquisition of the subject railroad assets is one step in what Mass DOT the Department of Transportation, anticipates will be an involved multi-step process that ultimately will lead to the establishment of a new railroad passenger service route in the Northeast. This, this was spearheaded by Governor Deval Patrick. When Governor Patrick stepped down in 2015, Mass DOT downgraded the project, saying they could not continue the effort because Connecticut wasn't interested and was in fact facing its own significant financial difficulties. In a surprising reversal, however, upgrade work on the line began in July 2018, and a $30 million infrastructure project took place over the next, uh, it was stretched out because of COVID, but the, the work was done. The track and tie work was was done over the, even during the pandemic, and has been completed now. And that brings the, the total spent to over $50 million. Of course, the, the, the plan has been that it would be justified, that that expense would be justified by the, the reintroduction of passenger rail service. It's a major taxpayer investment that at the moment is only benefiting a privately held company. Before the COVID lockdowns, there actually were positive developments in Connecticut, and we spent a fair amount of time trying to build up our presence there and, and make connections with the politicians who were, in, on the whole, very much in favor, very keen on, on adding, re restoring train service. One of the, the things that was happening then is there was much discussion about extending Metro-North service past Danbury to New Milford, and there was a million-dollar study commissioned aimed at figuring out how to build a rail link from Danbury to southeast New York on what's called the Maybrook Line that would make for, a, they called it the fast track for faster commuting to New York City. Both of those sections would be sections of the Berkshire line. So to paraphrase the late astronaut Neil Armstrong, one small step to New Milford, one giant leap toward passenger rail to the Berkshires. These plans are still afloat now, after the pandemic, under new leadership. Another possibility is one I went to Western Pennsylvania to explore in October 2022. A company there was refurbishing London underground cars for light, for light rail electric train service that would be very suitable for, for the distance that we have here in Massachusetts between the various towns that are along the line from Pittsfield down to the border. 
We talked about putting some of these cars on the upgraded Berkshire line and running them just over the border to the historic Canaan Station, where the Housatonic Railroad Company actually is based. So that that track would be quite suitable. And then we'd have a footprint in Connecticut, and Anne would have the the chance to give people, uh, let people ride the train here to have the convenience of it, but also to see what a what an asset it would be to the area, how convenient it would be, and, and actually what a beautiful ride it is as well. Restoration of passenger service on the Berkshire line, I want to note, is a completely different project from the Berkshire Flyer. A seasonal weekend service between Pittsfield and New York City run by Amtrak via Albany, New York, which is slightly to the north and west of Pittsfield. So it's a kind of elbow route. That initiative was modeled after the Cape Flyer, which brings summer weekend tourists from Boston to Cape Cod. The weekend Berkshire Flyer service is been criticized for being inflexible and and totally tourist oriented but it's it's that's not quite correct there actually is daily passenger service from Pittsfield to New York on the Albany route so the Berkshire Flyer passengers could certainly purchase a separate train for the regular daily service what's different is that the the daily Amtrak service makes requires one to actually step off the train and wait in Albany and then s- switch to another train that would take you to Pittsfield where the Berkshire Flyer it it sits and makes uh, some track changes but you can stay in the same seat and it's perfectly feasible to take the flyer in one direction and another train when you return home in any case with any of these proposed services and there are such projects all across the United States, in Indiana, in Montana, often using, just as we're talking about, using a line that used to have passenger trains and that has simply been reduced to to, to freight train only, where we're talking about now putting passengers back on. It's completely feasible to have both freight train and passenger trains running on the same line if it's done done correctly and using modern technology for the to ensure safety. The important question to ask about any of these these investments and often with taxpayer money is who benefits. Calculating the myriad benefits of passenger rail is something we've we've long thought about at the train campaign. We think about it, talk about it, and we ask that it be included in when the state makes you know, it commissions studies and research because so often departments of transportation are focused only on moving people from one point to the other. Calculating the benefits is not the focus of these, the kind of research they commission in general. But but we consider it essential to calculate the return on investment in terms of the environment, in terms of public health, economic vitality, and employment and educational opportunities, as well as the tax revenue to come from from the developments that are spurred by having excellent passenger train service. Uh, Perhaps the biggest difference between the Berkshire line that we are that we have so long focused on, and and the weekend Berkshire Flyer is the people that they will serve. Uh, train services like the Cape Flyer or the Berkshire Flyer are designed for weekend tourists, and for people who do. And, and in the case of the Berkshire Flyer, for to attract people who do not already come to the Berkshires, because you can get to the Berkshires quite easily by driving, if if you don't mind driving, and there is Metro North service to Wasaic as well as Amtrak service to Hudson. So it is it is feasible, but what what we have wanted is to have train service that actually comes to our towns here in Berkshire County. The Berkshire line would serve a much wider, more diverse, and a year-round market. It would be great for tourists and second homeowners too, of course, but it it would serve county residents who need to be able to get to New York regularly. And it would enable their friends and business colleagues who would suddenly have convenient access to the towns of Western Connecticut and Massachusetts. This was what I originally thought. I thought 
if there were a train service here, I would just tell my, you know, if I had a colleague who wanted to come and visit me, a colleague from Europe or a colleague from China, I'd say, all right, you fly to New York, go to Grand Central, go up to the ticket counter and say, I want a ticket to Great Barrington. And it would be as simple as that. To get here now is not simple for someone who's who's traveling from abroad. And and the there is a great has long been a great deal of of interest in having such such a train service. The Berkshire line was the top line item in a priority table included in the draft and at and and the the final Berkshire County 2020 Regional Transportation Plan. That's a long-range, 25-year comprehensive document that provides the basis for future transportation investment and planning in this region. Restored and improved passenger rail service to New York and to Boston will be a catalyst for sustainable economic development. It will give city dwellers access to our wonderful towns and cultural venues, to beautiful countryside and outdoor recreation, and it will offer country dwellers much, much easier access to employment and educational opportunities in the cities. And that's what it once did. So just to give you a sense of what how we're thinking about the future, I'm going to read you a passage from the Book of Berkshire, 1887. A journey from New York City to the southern half of the county which is the portion of this famous region most sought, requires but four hours and a half in drawing room cars or in first-class passenger cars that are the tidiest and best furnished and finished ones in the United States. The distance is about 150 miles. From Boston, the time is less than five hours, the distance being a little over 150 miles. I will say that that from my home in the center of Great Barrington to the set to Manhattan or to Boston is 125 miles. So I'm really, I'm not sure quite how they were measuring this. And to continue, three lines of railway cross the region and a line of railways extends up and down. The east and west line at the north end is the Hoosick Tunnel Road. The middle line is the Boston and Albany and the south line is the Hartford and Connecticut Western, which connects the Hudson and Connecticut rivers. From the center of the county at Pittsfield to the north end runs the Pittsfield and North Adams Railroad, and towards the south runs the Housatonic Line to Bridgeport, where the connection is had with the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Line. These railway lines offer accommodations for travel to and from the region that make it easily accessible, make the return to the city an easy and short matter. This is in 1887. No railroad in the country has taken greater pains to accommodate people who go to summer resorts than have been taken by the Housatonic Line. Though cars on express trains are run to and from New York in about four hours and a half, and if the traveler does not care to take the drawing room car, he can ride in a car that almost seems like one with its Brussels carpet, toilet room, fine upholstery, and cabinet finish. He can leave New York in the morning and eat a noon dinner in Berkshire or leave near the close of business hours and eat a late dinner or supper there. The facilities for return are equally good, for he can leave Berkshire at several convenient times, the last one being about 5 p.m., when an express train leaves to arrive in New York about 9. Well, we at the train campaign, and I personally, very much look forward to the day when when we have something like that a little bit faster, but it wouldn't have to be. It doesn't have to be high speed. I want to be able to to say to a colleague, go to Grand Central, buy a ticket for Great Barrington. And we certainly hope to see the service become so successful that we'll have a modern version of the 1940s Berkshire Express. That was train number 144. It offered a limited stop service every afternoon except Sundays with a parlor car and a broiler buffet. Thanks for joining me at Train Time. Don't forget to subscribe. Send me your suggestions for future shows and visit our YouTube channel, Train Campaign, for some great interviews and amazing historical footage, including a bit from the documentary, The Last Train to Pittsfield. 
filmed in 1971.